But in trying to think about what I would speak on this morning, I decided that uh, I would try to bring this more to Christians, and yet it would have meaning to those who are not Christians. Let me say again that when I use the word Christian, I am using it as it's defined and used in the scriptures. And those who hear me preach all the time know that I say that all the time. But I want people to understand that uh, we're not talking about the denominational concept of a Christian because no such thing exists in the New Testament. When I use the word church, then of course I'm talking about the church that Jesus built, Matthew 16, 18, and Acts chapter 2. So my lesson this morning is basically aimed at members of the church, the New Testament Christians. Although the world greatly needs it right now, and to some extent or the other, uh, fear and anxiety and worry is bothering a lot of folks, to say the least, some a lot more than others. And panic has set in with some, and some of that subsiding. And people get all upset over the strangest things. But that doesn't mean that uh, we should forget who we are and how we're to live, how we're to think. So I'm talking about today from the scriptures, controlling fear, anxiety, and worry. To do that, I'm going to go to a passage that most all of you, if not all of you, have studied and heard preached on for a long time, and that is the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. And of course, you know, this is where Jesus is saying, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, if you look at the context of this, you notice that it's in what we call the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, this comment or this verse comes out of a discussion of not laying up our treasures on earth, but to the contrary, laying up for ourselves treasures in heaven. The affairs of this present world always work the same way. And anybody that knows anything about history knows that there's been all kinds of epidemics and pandemics throughout the world. And in the time the United States has existed uh, within the boundaries of the same, there have been all kinds of diseases and plagues and so forth hit us. Uh, some people may not be that much aware of that, but it is the case. So, when we see him telling us not to lay up treasures on earth, then the natural question that arises as a result of such teaching is how are we going to provide for ourselves? Well, you see the principle coming out here concerning how do we deal with times in which we live. That's even caused us to do what we're doing this morning regarding delivery of the sermon live over Facebook. Jesus, first of all, says that worrying is profitless. Worry is to take thought about that which you can do absolutely nothing about. Now, there may be a lot of thought taken until you come to a point where you realize you can't do anything about it. And it may be that today you can't do something about it. And tomorrow or the next day or next week, you can but there's no use giving thought to that, which you can do absolutely nothing about. So we're doing what we can now in view of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And it affects the church. We're people in the world just like everybody else. We're in the world, but if we're faithful, we're not of the world. And that's the point that always needs to be kept in mind if we're going to begin to overcome the fear and the anxiety and the worry that dominates people who have no hope in Jesus Christ, who are not New Testament Christians, thus not members of the Lord's church. So the real priority in our life should not be where we're going to get our food and our clothing uh, or our water or our toilet tissue or our shelter for that matter. Those things do not come first in the mind and in the life of a faithful child of God. What is the real priority? Notice I say real, facing reality. The real priority should be to seek God's kingdom first and also God's righteousness. 
that comes first too. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, we like to know how things work. We like to be able as human beings to see them work out as we humans like to do these things. But God's bigger than that. God's bigger than what we can realize. God is the first cause who is uncaused. God controls everything. He spoke everything into existence. He brought time into existence. He can work in it or he can work out of it. And he started it and someday he'll end it. But we shall go on and on because once he creates, it, creates us as individual persons, then although now we're in the flesh and subject to time and space and the frailties of the flesh, we are promised in his word that we are to be able, if we're found faithful, to enjoy eternal glories in heaven with him. And that's what we labor for. So we learn to have the proper relationship to the affairs of this present world, to the material, and to things. One thing you need to remember, whatever the New Testament teaches about peace and contentment here on earth, because we faithfully serve him, it is always said in the context, even as the whole Bible is given in this context to us, given to guide, lead, and direct us in pathways of righteousness, with the reality before us that this life will end for us. So when we read whatever the Bible says about finding peace and happiness, contentment, releasing ourselves from fear and anxiety and so on, then it's got to be said within the scope of the fact that death is into the world when sin entered the world. And thus the curse is passed on all men because of sin in the world that from dust uh, God made us and into dust we'll return. So whatever you read about and all these things shall be added unto us if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, it's all said in that context. We still must die. You cannot live such a faithful life before God that you will not physically die. The only thing that would stop that would be the Lord's second coming. And either way, there will be a great, great transition from the earthly scene and fleshly body to what will be for eternity. So I want us to think about this priority in facing realities that people who don't believe in God and who don't know their Bible correctly just simply don't have. Look at the principle, seek a diligent search of patient inquiry. That's what we're doing. That's what we want to do. That's what we urge everyone to do. It's akin to hungering and thirsting after righteousness. And we'll see righteousness later in this verse. Notice what is said in the parable of the lost coin. Now, the coin, not being a being, a person, could not know it was lost or saved. But the persons whose coin it was would know that he or she had lost the coin. In Luke 15, 8 through 9, Listen to what our Lord taught. Either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently until she find it. And when she's found it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. So it's obvious she did all she could to find what was hers. And God, dealing with free moral agents such as we are, has done all that it's possible that he can do as an omniscient God, omnipresent, omnipotent, to save us, being that we are free moral agents. Thus he reasons with the thought of the gospel. And he reasons with us because he made us rational creatures. And he informs us through his word all about what we need to know, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, as to how to live on earth that we can live eternally with him in heaven. Notice the idea of preparing or this diligent search uh, of patient inquiry to learn about God and his kingdom. Ezra 7 and verse 10 in the Old Testament, For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord. But it wasn't just that. The scripture doesn't end there. 
Why was he trying to seek the Lord? He says then, and to do it. Do what? Do the law that he seeks after. And not only that, but to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. So a right attitude, a right state of mind, a right mindset must exist within every one of us if we're to benefit from God, Christ, the gospel, and the teaching of the Bible, and know how to live this life on earth. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 29. Speaking to the children of Israel, but if one from but if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, and thou shalt find him, if thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. Now, when you consider the soul or the heart of man, you're considering his intellectual, rational powers. You're considering his will, his emotions, and his conscience. Best way to describe your person or my person is that way. And so God says all of what makes us what we are must be used and utilized in learning the will of God, as Ezra said, with the intent to do it and to teach it to others. Then Jesus taught in Matthew 7, 7 through 11, Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For him, for everyone that seeketh, or asketh, receiveth. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. And then he reasons with the people of his day. Or what man is there of you? whom if his son asks bread, will give him a stone. Or if he asks a fish, will give him a serpent. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that watch it, that ask him? Now we've often pointed out where he talks about asking, when he talks about uh, seeking and all of that, that in the Greek, the present tense verb means you don't do it one time, but you keep on asking and knocking and seeking. You just never stop. And that's what we're to do all through our life on earth. And the great thing about it is, is that he promises you, and he's true to his word, that you will find what you're asking about, what you're seeking, what you're knocking to have open to you. So it comes down to accepting his word. The simplest definition of faith is taking God at his word. So all that has to do with this diligent search of patient inquiry and seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now, notice the ye. Well, that's having to do with people, isn't it? In the context, people who would worry first about their own personal needs before considering God is not wise at all. And he spends verses 25 through 31 showing that people are, like other people, humans have human desires. And they act alike. So you can see how people act all over the world. This past couple of weeks has been a pretty good laboratory experiment to see how people conduct themselves under hard and pressing times. And they don't do any different in these past couple of weeks than they have in years past or hundreds or thousands of years past. So when Jesus says, seek ye, he meant you. You remember the posters regarding Uncle Sam and the draft, and it said, I want you. Jesus wants you to do what? To seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. This is because we have a personal relationship with Christ. Now, I don't mean that by saying, you personally know him like we know one another in the flesh. It is because you have that kind of trust based on his word in him that he will do you good and never do you evil. The scripture plainly tells us, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now that's going to be pretty personal when we do that. That everyone, notice every single one, may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. God wants us. I guess we could say he, he wants to personally possess us, but we must desire him to possess us. 
God can tell us to do things in this life, and we can say, no, I don't want to. And he will not force it upon us. Notice what uh, is said in 1 Peter 2 in verse 9. And remember 2 Corinthians that we just quoted from, and 1 Peter, these are letters written to Christians, those who are of Christ. And so we read Peter saying, but ye are an elect race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, which means a people for God's own possession, that ye may show forth the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So it's obvious we're here for a purpose. We're here to find him, show him we love him, to demonstrate our faith in him and his word and his system of salvation, the gospel system. He wants us, he desires us to partake of his divine nature. Peter wrote again, Peter, 2 Peter 1, verses 3 and 4, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, Notice that comes through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. We were called by the gospel. We listened to it. We understood it. We believed it. We took God at his word and we complied with God's terms of pardon. Notice he says it's through that gospel or by that gospel whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Notice one of those promises, Matthew 6, 33, and all these things shall be added unto you that by these, what is taught in his word, by these promises he's promised in his word that he keeps, ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So as we live like the New Testament teaches, we're developing the divine nature. We're seeing things as God sees us. You know, sometimes, and I made a remark about this some weeks ago in a sermon, that when you study logic, you're studying how God thinks. So when you see, prove all things hold fast that which is good, 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, or how that Paul reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, that God is appealing to us the way he made us to understand and do anything. So we have the opportunity to employ the truth of the gospel that we can develop a divine appetite, a divine nature, a divine disposition of heart to live on this earth to show God we love him and have faith in him and his system of salvation that he can get us from earth to heaven. Now, with that, let me pause here and say, what does a pandemic like this really do for us? Well, we're cautious. We try to take care of ourselves. But the big thing it says is something's going to kill you someday. Somewhere or the other, you're going to die. And to use Shakespeare's terminology, you're going to so, uh, shuffle off this mortal coil. The Bible's plain about it. And that is we have an earthly tabernacle. And we are going to put it off someday. We're going to do those things in this life until in this life, in this flesh, it's no more. So then does it not emphasize the importance of Matthew 6.33 and being able to get through times like this? Listen to what the Hebrews writer said to Jewish Christians who are actually departing from the faith. Hebrews 12, 10 reads, For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, who's he talking about there? Well, the context has him talking about God chastening us that we might be better. Well, I would suggest to you is to help us have that divine nature that Peter talked about. And so he chastens us for our good. He reminds us that under our fathers chastened us to get us to do what they wanted us to do. But he says the chastening that comes upon the faithful child of God comes because God loves him and is trying to get him to live so that he can develop the divine nature and heaven will be his home. So why should we let affairs like this pandemic or whatever it might be in times past, it was World War II, then World War One, and years before that, there were there was the Civil War and so on. There's always been something and always will be. So why should we let the affairs of this present world cause us to reject God when really they should be causing us to 
draw near to God. If you watch television much, and I'm sure you have regarding all of this COVID-19 pandemic, you haven't seen many secular humanists saying, well, I think I better rethink this business about whether God exists or whether Jesus is deity or whether the Bible is the inspired word of God. They ought to be. They ought to see that this thing spread so fast that the greatest governments on earth, the best economy in the world, those who possess all kinds of natural things didn't help them at all. They're all in the same boat because we're all humans and flesh on this earth. So is there a way that uh, this thing happening to us can better us? Yeah. It should drive us closer to practicing Matthew 6.33. It should make us realize, regardless of who you are, what you have or don't have, or your station in life, that it makes no difference. That God can take it all away in a minute. That doesn't mean that he did this directly to allow this little virus to do what it did, but that thing can develop. It doesn't even tell us who may have developed it or how it developed on its own or whatever happened. That doesn't make any difference. It's out there in the world running around, and who knows what will be next, except there will be a next as long as this world goes on. But what should concern you? What should chiefly concern you? But seek ye first, not second, third, or fourth, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So I can't say anything but first means first. doesn't mean tenth. In um, jobs, it means God comes first. In Luke 18, 22, Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, The rich young ruler, Yet likest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. Well, some people have misinterpreted this, as that means everything you got in order to serve God, you've got to give it away. That's not what this passage teaches at all. It does say that you shouldn't let anything material, even your job, come between you and serving God, compromising the truth living contrary to God's word. This is a point that must be emphasized regarding first meaning first. The kingdom of God and his righteousness should come before friends. Matthew 19, verse 29, and everyone that has forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands, for my name's sake. What do you think that name is? It's Christian. Shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. Did Jesus mean what he said? And did he say what he meant? Surely he's helping us understand the word first and what our priority should be and how should we should deal with things such as this Pandemic, who knows, as I say, what it will be next. Could be a war. Who knows? But first means we seek God first above our family. We seek him first above our jobs, above our friends, and above our family. Luke 14, verse 26. King James Version, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren, and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Again, did he mean what he say, said, and did he say what he meant? The point being here is that when he says hate, as it was used in 1611, it's not as it's used now. Hate there means you've got to love all in the list less than you love me. You love me first, foremost, and always with all that you have. That's the first commandment, to love God with all that we are and have. And that's exactly what he's saying. God doesn't take second place. He never has. He never will. So in seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then that means above jobs, above friends, above family, because God is always demanded to come first. Listen to what he said to Israel of old in Exodus chapter 13, verse 2. Sanctify unto me all the firstborn, whatsoever 
openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and of beast. It is mine. Then in Exodus 23, verse 19, and chapter 34, verse 26, he teaches the same thing. The first of the first fruits of thy land thou shalt bring unto the house of the Lord thy God. Then in Proverbs chapter 3, and verse 9, Honor the Lord with thy substance, and with the first fruits of all thine increase. Well, if that doesn't teach us that first means first, that God comes first, he will not tolerate being second. He only wants to be first, and that's the way it's going to be. Then we must, it's obligatory on each one of us, to put him first. That raises a question of about how to put God first. Some of that should be already obvious to anybody. Jesus did it this way when he was in the garden, knowing full well what was ahead of him in the terrible ordeal of scourging and mockery and false worship and slander and ultimately the terrible crucifixion he underwent because he loved you and me. He said in the garden, when he expressed his thoughts to God, there's any other way that men can be saved without me having to go this, please. But then he said this, and until we develop this, we'll never grow in the Lord. In fact, you'll never become a Christian. He said this is Heavenly Father, not my will, but thine be done. Not my will, Jesus said, but mine be done. Can you think of a better motto for you during these times, but then ordinary times or whatever the times may bring? It means we must not compromise first things. That's probably the most difficult thing. If I have two places to go, one to get the Lord's work done and one to do as I please and what somebody else pleases, then I choose to do the Lord's work first. A lot of brethren never have learned that. It's hard to seem, seem like to get them to understand it. They can read Matthew 6, 33, intellectually understand it, but then bringing their will under Christ's will as manifested in Matthew 6, 33 is, it's seemingly impossible for some, and yet we know there's not because God's never said, do this, and it's impossible for you to do it. No, the attitude of Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but thine be done, is what we need. You'll remember that Satan wants to distract us, so a whole lot of things that are innocent, that are of this world, we'll give our time to that, and the church takes second place. God takes second place. Brethren, don't you understand that when you talk about the work of the church as it's set out in the New Testament, you're talking about the work of God. But the church is people. The church are the Christians in the way I've defined it. So when we choose to do other things under the Lord's work, the Lord stands waiting. He's put off. And that won't work with him. So Satan can distract us even with innocent things that are not wrong within themselves if we give ourselves over to them and put the Lord second. Adam and Eve compromised. Notice how that Satan appealed to them when God said, don't eat this fruit, because in the day you eat of it, you'll die. Notice that they lived on the level of the flesh. Eve did because she thought it was a beautiful thing. She considered it good for food, and then it was good to make one wise. She took of it and ate, and then gave it to Adam, and he did eat. Plunged the world into sin, and sin is a transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6, and verse 23. And all have sinned, and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. You remember that King Saul in Israel compromised. He said, the people made me do this. Then Judas Iscariot sold his Lord. He did that for money. Now, look, look what we found here. Eve compromised and caused Adam to compromise because he didn't pay attention to what was going on. Because of the beautiful, because of what was good for food, 
and because it would make one wise in this present world. Saul did it with people. The people pressed him, he said. And Judas Iscariot did it for money. Those things that are beautiful, good for food, good to make one wise, and people and money. Now, that's what makes everybody sin against God. All these things are still working today, just like they were this time last year, or like they were 50 years ago. World War II, World War I, Civil War, Revolutionary War, whatever famines there were, and whatever pestilences have hit men. So if we're to abide by Matthew 6.33 and fear, free ourselves of fear and anxiety and worry and be able to get through something like we're doing, engaged in now, then we'll live like we do every day. If you're faithful to God according to his word, and you'll seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things you've added unto you. Remember, righteousness, as David defined it, by inspiration, Psalms 119, verse 172, is all of God's commandments. When Paul preached, he preached the whole counsel of God. We preach the total truth of God as set out the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25, and we're to live it. So however we face the problems of today and whatever they may be tomorrow, then we're to face them one day at a time because that's all you can do anyway. And we will relieve ourselves of all kinds of problems that the world that knows not the word of God, that cares nothing about the kingdom of heaven, that cares nothing about the commandments of God, they'll never know this peace. This is the kind of peace that can come when your body's undergoing misery, when all sorts of people around you are suffering. But to know you are at peace with your God, to know that your conscience is clear, to know that you're seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you, the things you need in life, all set within the ideas I said in the beginning, that in this world, these things abide. But the Lord has made it clear, no matter how well you live in this world to serve him, death is certain. It is appointed unto men once to die, and after that, the judgment. So this is offered to tell us how to get through life daily, to tell us how to get through life in troublesome times that we're undergoing now. And it means that all of God's will must be first, foremost, and always in our mind to learn it and to do it, to glorify him, to show our love for him and our faith in him and his system of salvation. So we want to alleviate fear and worry and anxiety. And if that happens, then God in doing his will must, must come first in our lives. Now, what do we say? We close out by simply pointing out to accomplish what we've studied about Matthew 6, 33, in this life, of course, in this fleshly body, each one of us must seek, must seek first, must seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, and God will keep his promises. And I don't even have to know how he can do it if I do my part. Now, I would like to say, since somebody might be there listening who would like to become a Christian, how do you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? Well, to seek the benefits and privileges of the kingdom. Well, you can't do that without being a citizen of the kingdom. So it is that when you read John chapter 3, verses 3 and 5, Jesus tells us that in order to get in the kingdom, you must be born again, and that that birth is a birth of water and the Spirit. Thus, in the Great Commission, go you into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, because the gospel is God's power to save, Mark 16, 15, Romans 1, verse 16. He then says in verse 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Thus, when the Spirit in the Word of Christ reveals the terms of pardon for the remission of sins, and we humbly from the heart believe it, then we repent of our sins, as we're commanded in Acts 17, verse 30. Confess our faith in the Christ as the Son of God, Romans 10, 10. Complete our obedience to the gospel by being baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins. Acts 2, verse 38, Galatians 3, verse 27. And to the Christians, then renew your strength in the Lord. Be more determined than ever to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, knowing all these things shall be added unto you. And erase the anxiety and the fear and the worry that dominates the world. 
So if anybody has a need or would like to study the Bible more or to become a Christian or to repent of your sins, we urge you to take care of that. And if you need to contact us in order to help you obey the gospel, to serve God, then we stand ready to accept those calls and those pleas and do what we can. Thank you for being with us. I hope it's been beneficial, not only for everyday Christian living or how to become a Christian, but to strengthen us in this time and whatever times may lie ahead. Thank you again, and we'll, we'll sign off at this time.